1 John chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 7 to 21. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. No one's ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is perfected in us. This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. He's given to us from his spirit. And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent the Son as Saviour of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him and he in God. And we've come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. In this way, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, for we are as His, as he is in this world. There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear, because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And we have this command from him. The one who loves God must also love his brother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, if you open your newsletters up there, you've got an outline there on the left-hand side. Uh, on the top right, you've got some household questions, God willing. Uh, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Uh, like I said at the start, we're beginning uh, a new series on love uh, over the next four weeks. I uh, Like the series that we had on Christ and, uh, there are so many passages you could choose for a series like this, aren't there? And uh, we're not going to dive to the depths of love in the Bible in any way that will satisfy all of our questions. But we just want to spend some time over the next four weeks looking at it together. Uh, I think we need to do that uh, because our world is desperate to love and to be loved. Our world is desperate to love and to be loved. Uh, I tried. I thought, can I come up with song titles? Can I come up with movie themes? Can I come up with... Well, no, because... I think everywhere you look in popular culture, you'll find love in some form or another. Uh, The history of music, uh, love is everywhere. Uh, Popular movies, the ones that kind of make us feel good, uh, love is everywhere. Uh, Love drives plot lines. Love drives advertising. Love drives social media. Love drives pulp media. Everywhere you look, you're being offered something to love, aren't you? You're being told you must love. You're being reminded to be more loving. Uh, And the phrase that was characterised in the 1960s will never go out of fashion, make love, not war. So it's no surprise that when a bunch of clergy gather at Keep It for their clergy conference and the speaker says love, someone yells out, but love is love. Because that's the way we've distilled it today, isn't it? Love is love. Uh, you've heard that phrase. Uh, I could not find out where it originated from. So a lot of time searching, but it was popularised over the last few years as we as a nation debated an expression of love as we talked about marriage. Uh, it's actually existed before that debate and before that vote, by a number of years. Uh, It's become a phrase that says the issue is love matters. Not who loves, not how they love, 
not where the love takes place. Let's just focus on love because love is love. It's become the most accessible and used definition of love in our world today, I think. Love is love. But our speaker at clergy conference helped us dull clergy realise that there are some problems with this phrase. I I want to just highlight a few. I seem to remember in second class that you can't define a word by using the same word. Love is love. Doesn't that just make is an equal sign? (laughs) And you've got the same on either side, but it becomes kind of circular, doesn't it? Love is love, is love, is love, is love. It's circular. Uh, It actually becomes a kind of blank check. So you can fill it up with whatever you want because both sides of the equation are equal and you're defining a word by the same word. Our our, our speaker then said, well, what kind of love? As we were chatting later on, he's a runner like I'm a runner. Is my love for long runs the same as my love for chocolate? Well, sometimes there is an equal sign there. Is my love for my family, my love for my wife, the same as my love for a lamb roast? Love is love. (laughs) And it becomes even more problematic when you open the Bible. That's always the case, isn't it? Because when you open the Bible, there isn't just one word for love, is there? There are a number of words for love. And what happens when the same word for love is used in really contrasting ways? For God loved the world in this way, he sent his one and only son, so that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16. And then we turn to 2 Samuel 13 verse 4. And in the Greek translation, we're told that Amnon loves his sister Tamar. And it's the same Greek word as John 3.16. What do we do with that? Do you see some of the problems? Love is love. So flattens, empties and makes circular the definition of love in our world that actually has no content. No nuance, no colour, no substance and no meaning. And then it can be used in so many different ways. So you can love the way you want to love and because love is love, any challenge is problematic. And it becomes even more of an issue when we go, well, if that's our definition for love, how am I ever going to love? How am I ever going to be loved? How am I going to distinguish love? There are some big issues there, aren't there? I suppose the question we need to ask ourselves as people who say we belong to Jesus is, is there a better way? Is there a better way? And the aim of this series is to help us think through love. Like I said at the start, we're just going to scratch the surface. We're just going to find out some ideas and my desire, my hope, is that we'll keep exploring that, not just as individuals, but as a community, as a mob together. Are we going to look at love four ways? God to us, us to God, us to each other, us to the world. Now, I say it's love four ways, but when you actually read a passage like this, it's really only love one way, isn't it? It starts because God loved us. God looked at his enemies. God looked at those who were cracked in bearing his image and said, I love you. And today we're going to look at that. Let me pray and we'll dive into it together. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Father, the the concept of love, uh, the idea of love, the reality of love, the content of love, the context of love, uh, all of those uh, we see in this part of the Bible are central to who you are, and that means they're central to who we are. Uh, Father, help us to start thinking in a better way about love, a love that is 
not flat, but has a wonderful geography. A love that isn't empty, but is full to overflowing. A love that isn't colourless, but is vibrant. Love that isn't circular, but moves relationally. Love that isn't empty, but happens in everyday life. Father, please apply these truths to us today so that we reflect you to the world and people know what love truly is. In Jesus' name, amen. My point two on the outline, uh, please have your Bibles open at uh, 1 John chapter 4. Uh, I, I want to apologise to Phil. Uh, this is uh, off script. Uh, I asked Phil a few years ago to do a teaching weekend at We War on 1 John. Was that right, mate? Yeah, I didn't realise how much of a burden I was giving to him when I opened 1 John and tried to work on it myself. So sorry, Phil. Uh, it's a tough book. It's really tough, uh, but really rich, and there is a huge amount of stuff in it. As far as I can work out, John's writing to a bunch of God's people uh, who seem to have been rocked by false teachers, uh, people who are saying we're part of the mob but then walking out and then turning back and attacking them. Uh, There's a lot of debate about when it was written, probably sometime after AD 70, and he writes to them a really rich letter saying we're eyewitnesses. We've seen a bloke called Jesus who came in the flesh And he did something in the world that dealt with your brokenness. Now, that sounds pretty familiar because we get that right throughout the Bible. But then he burrows down into it and and he says to them, listen, there are some key markers about being part of the mob. That's if you confess who Jesus is. That's if you live like Jesus lived. And that's if you love like Jesus loves. That's what defines God's people. And in this part of the letter, he starts to assert some things that he's talked about earlier on, but he really sharpens them into some good slogans, because our world likes slogans, doesn't it? Love is love. And he gives us some really bald assertions. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, love is from God. Four syllables. Or if you want it even more boldly and you like it in threes, look at verse 8. God is love. That's a big phrase, isn't it? Christians like to bandy that phrase around. I heard it a lot at General Synod. It's a bold assertion, isn't it? It's a bold assertion, God is love. Assertions are sometimes hard to establish, often hard to argue against. And you can imagine someone reading this and saying, well, John, how can you say that? What's your evidence for that assertion? And so he then unpacks it in five parts in this part of his letter to show them what that love is. The first two parts are similar assertions, and then he digs down into the evidence. The first is love has a source. Love doesn't create itself. Love isn't something that just hangs out there and you fall into. Love has a source. Love starts somewhere. Love has has an address, if you like. And John wants us to not only know that truth about love, that it begins somewhere, but he actually wants to, us to know the postcode, the location. So there's nothing mysterious or obscure about love. Look there in verse 7. Love is from God. Look at verse 8, God is love. Look at verse 9, God's love. He lays it on really thickly or all over the place. Love has a source and its name is God. Now there is a lot more going on here. Just think about that phrase, God is love. It's unlike the phrase, love is love, isn't it? Because there's two different concepts. (laughs) The equal sign works there, doesn't it? Because you're not defining God by himself, you're defining God by one of his attributes. You're not defining love by itself, you're defining love by someone. John deals with that elsewhere. That's another sermon series. But he begins with this assertion, love has a source. Moves on to a second assertion, love has a direction. Love has a direction. One of the things that's astounded me about the way I accepted the phrase love is love, because when I first saw it, I thought, yeah, gee, that's snappy, I like that. I might be a bit slower than you guys. 
But when I thought about it, I thought when I say love is love, there's no direction, is there? (laughs) It doesn't move anywhere. It just sits or moves around in circles. Love is love is love is love. But but we, we experience love with a direction, don't we, in our lives? The anecdotal evidence is that love starts somewhere and moves to something. It has a source and it has a recipient. John makes that assertion in, the, in verse 7 and he says, love is from God. Do you notice that he doesn't leave love in God? It begins with God. It is who he is, but then it is what he displays. It comes out of him. Uh, It's there in verse 9. God's love was revealed among us. It's moved from God. Look there in verse 10. A love consists in this, not that we love God, but that he loved us. There's a directional word, sent his son. Look there in verse 11. God loved us in this way. He states it again and again, verse 13, verse 14, verse 16. Love has a source, God. Love comes from God and moves. It has a direction. Where's the direction? It's to humans, to those who have the image of God. That's such an important beginning place, those two assertions, because it means that love moves. It's relational. It's not stagnant. It's not circular. Without that movement, there's no relationship, is there? It just sits flat, a circle, moving endlessly on itself. But if love has a source and if love has a direction, then love is definitely about a relationship from God to us. But we know know relationships aren't easy, don't we? (laughs) Uh, And that's what John covers next because love has a source, love has a direction, love has a context. Love has an environment. Love is love has no context when you think about it, does it? It just hangs out there. Uh, It exists in a vacuum. Uh, It becomes this really malleable, moldable phrase uh, that I can move into into any environment. I can move it to my mealtimes. I can move it to my gym. I can move it to my sleep times. I can move it to my pleasure. I can move it to my workplace. I I can just move it anywhere. And then I can fill it up with what I want to fill it up with. Uh, It's a circular thing that exists in a vacuum and then I can do with it what I want. But love that has a source and love that has a direction has an environment. Look there in verse 9. God's love was revealed. What's the context? What's the environment? Among us. In this world. Look there in verse 10. Love consists in this. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The environment for love is among us. It's in this world. It has a shape and a smell. You can touch it. You can see it. You can write about it. It has a reality and a substance to it. And when John says it was sent among us, do you notice that he connects it with something about us in verses 9 and 10? But that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for? Well, if God is defined by love, what are we defined by? Our sins. Who are we? We're sinners. We're grasping aspirants for godness. I want his job. I'm going to take his job. I can do a better job of God than God. Sin's the attitude and action that says, I'm God and God is not. That's the environment, isn't it? The context for love is not a card that you send someone. The context for love is not a pleasurable, warm and comfortable environment. 
The context for love is not a place of natural affection or easy relationship, hot chocolates, marshmallows and long walks. The context for love is a war zone. It is enmity. It's opposition. It's conflict. It's rebellion. It's secession from God. It's rejection of God. And God moves his love into that. To people who are by nature his enemies. In such an environment, in such a harsh environment, in such a hard, cold, opposed environment, love's got to have a content to survive, doesn't it? Otherwise, it'll be squashed. And that's the fourth part of this unpacking. Love has a source. Love has a direction. Love has a context. Love has a content. Look again at verse 9. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Do you remember last week we said that the shape for decision-making was very obvious? What was the shape for decision-making? It was shaped like Jesus, wasn't it? It's no mistake that the shape of love, the content of love, is the same man, Jesus. The content of God's love for humans is his only son. The content of God's love for humans as they rebel against God is to send his son into a world that strains every fibre against him. The content of God's love for humans who are seeking to take God's throne is to send his sons in, as we saw, to stand in for us as the very enemies of God. The one who lives, as you've heard me say time and time again, the one who lives the life we couldn't live so that he could die the death we deserve and rise from the dead to say, I stood in for you, and it worked. The content of God's love for humans in a war zone is to give sacrificially of himself his one and only son. And as we spend time in that series that Ben took us through with the real Jesus. Jesus did that willingly, didn't he? He did that in a self-aware way and he did that knowing that it was the expression of God's love in a context of violence, brokenness, opposition, rebellion. Love has a source. Love has a direction. Love has a context. Love has a content. Oh, we're back to five again. Love has a consequence. The amazing thing about love is love is that there's no consequence to the love. It doesn't reject anything in order to affirm something else. It doesn't move anywhere, so there's no achievement. It doesn't leave something, so there's no cost. But love, as we've just looked at it, does have a consequence, doesn't it? There's a preference, there's a focus, there's a change. Look at verse 9, so that we might live through him. Look at verse 7, born of God and knowing God. Look at verse 10, he stood in for us. God's love is for humans, source, direction, for their good. As Pete reminded us yesterday, it takes us from the domain of death into the kingdom of light, doesn't it? It takes us from darkness to wholeness. 
It takes us from rejecting God to knowing God. It takes us from restless people to people who rest in Jesus. It takes us, as we've seen in Matthew, from outsiders to insiders. As we saw last week, it transfers and transforms. It's not circular. It's not flat. It's not tasteless. But it takes enemies and makes them family. There are the five parts of love. Starts off with those assertions and then gives evidence. As Ben has reminded us, as we looked at the real Jesus, he actually existed. You could pinch him and poke him and kill him and he'd walk out of a tomb and it would stay empty. Do you notice how that understanding of love is very different to love is love? Love is directional. Love is relational. Love is gracious and merciful and kind. Love is displayed. Love is sacrificial. Love seeks the best for the enemy. Love has a consequence. Love is patient. Love confronts sin. Love deals with sin. There is so much more. You could open your Bible and you could read 1 Corinthians 13 and go, there is Jesus. You could read Philippians 2, 5 to 11 and go, there is love. You could look at Ephesians 2, 1 to 10 as Max read us and see that in verse 4, the linchpin is the love of God. You could look at Mark 10, 45 and go, love serves. You could look at Luke 23 and see love forgives as it dies. You could look at Matthew 5, 38 to 48 and go, love actually cares for my enemy. You could look at Hosea 11, 1 to 11 and go, God loved his kid who rejected him by sending his son to die for them. God's love's always been like that, hasn't it? Right throughout the whole Bible. The problem with love is love, I'm at point three on the outline, is that love is love is a profoundly individual statement, isn't it? Love is love is a profoundly individual statement. It has no direction, no context, no content, no consequence, no source. That means it's mine. I can do with it what I want because it doesn't move anywhere. God is love is not such individualism, is it? God is love is communal. It moves from a source to someone who's an enemy. In fact, when you just look at the phrase God is love, it's still communal, isn't it? What do we just say in our statement of belief? What do we believe about God? He's three in one, isn't he? So even just to say God is love is to say love is about a community. And then that love pours out of the community of God himself and creates a community. You you look around this morning and there are 85 gods or would-be gods sitting together. Left to our own devices, we're competitors, aren't we? We'll do it nicely. But we all want to be God, and yet God sends his love to take aspirants to be God and make them his community. How does that start? Look at at verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. It begins with God loving us. People stop at that command and then don't realise that it began with God forgiving us. And God actually stepping into a war zone in order to create a community which is known for its display of the same love that God has given us. Look there in verse 21, it finishes with the same command. And we have this command from him, the one who loves God, because God first loved him, must also love his brother. But it does more than that. Look there in verse 11. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. And no one's ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is perfected in us. If God loved us in this way, as a community created by God, we must love each other in this way, We'll deal with that in the third week. But as that happens, what exists in the world? A living, breathing example of God's love because no one's ever seen him. But someone walks through the door 
or someone comes to Bible study, or someone sees God's people catching up for a coffee for eight, or people walk into a men's breakfast and they see God's love. A living, breathing example. In fact, they see the better story, don't they? Isn't that what we asked at the start? Isn't there a better way? And the result is a community known for its love because God first loved it. The result is a community that is fearless. Look in verse 17. In this way, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence when in the day of judgment. For we are as he is in this world. There's no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Not only is there a better way, but there's a better future, isn't there? A future that isn't taken up with fear because the world is going to end. There is judgment coming down the track. The door will shut. You see, when you grasp love in the way we've defined it with those five parts, God's love for us, we come to the conclusion that there is no other community in Narrabri, New South Wales or the world like God's mob that live a better way. There are many communities that will offer you affection, There are many communities that will bind you emotionally. There are many communities that will offer you relationship. But there should be no community like God's community. With love that goes into a war zone and makes enemies the friends of God. With love that goes into a war zone by sacrificing their own self, their most precious possession, with love that goes into a war zone and says to any enemy, I want peace, with love that goes into a war zone and calls evil evil and changes someone to family. There's nothing like it. There's no mob like it. But it does pose some questions, doesn't it? Are we actually living that better story? (laughs) There's a wonderful phrase, your best life now. Are we living that better story? Are we living that better story? Do we love each other with the same love that goes into a war zone because God first loved us? Do we love each other as a community walking together with grace and patience? Do we love each other so that when people say, what does God look like, we say, look at his mob. Do we love each other across generations? Remember Titus, older women and younger women and older men and younger men, where we not only confront sin, but then walk with each other through sin because God has made enemies family. Do we display love as a better story by saying in our town that Jesus is the Son of God and died for our sins? In this town, there is one community that has the better story. That's us, isn't it? Are we actually living that better story so people meet God as love in our town? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, It's terrific to be reminded that we receive your love. Thank you for that great goodness. Thank you that you sent your son as the content of love into the context of war Thank you for you being the source and there being a direction. Thank you for the consequence. Father, please help us to live this better story here so that others will know what you are like, 
know your forgiveness in Jesus Christ and come to live that better story too. Amen. Any questions? Yes, Roz. Yeah. What do I mean by that? It's a good question, isn't it, Roz? Um, <laughs> um, uh, so Roz has asked, and I'm repeating the question because of the people at home online. Uh, in the Bible studies, uh, I mentioned that God is love, meets us as humans, receives us as humans, and then leaves us humans. So I think one of the ideas that I'm getting at there is that as this type of human who is broken and cracked, God's love meets us and receives us as we are. But one of the things we love about God is that we say God's love receives us as we are. Does it ever leave us as we are? Never leaves us as we are, does it? It actually takes us to true humanity, restores Colossians 3.10, which we read last week, restores us in the image of our creator. So I think that's what I was saying there. He receives us as this type of human and then that same love leaves us as a human restored. Two different types of human, a sinner, forgiven. And so the same love doesn't just leave us as we are, it restores us to what we should be, which is someone who has the image of God remade in them. As we saw there in verse 7 and 8, we actually now know God properly. So I think that's probably what I was getting at there, digging at the idea that God's love accepts you, but it doesn't just leave you as you are, it restores you to true humanity. Does that give a bit of clarity? Good question. I hate writing things because I always get challenged on what I wrote and um, it's a good challenge to make, Roz. It's terrific. Yeah, Pete? It says that there's no fear in love. Yeah. But where is fear God? Yeah. Is that right? It is right. Yeah. Right. So Pete's question at home is, it says there's no fear in love, but we're meant to fear God. Okay. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 1, and it's verse 7, not verse 9 and 10, sorry, Bible study, um, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, in, in, um, in 1 John 4, and it's verses 17 to 21, what's the context for that discussion of fear there? It's very clear in that passage, not, not a rhetorical question. It's the day of judgment. Okay, And so that phrase is, when you face judgment day, you will have been perfected by the love of God. You don't have anything to fear because your judgment's been taken. So on that day, you don't have the fear, gee, I really should have dealt with Jesus a bit earlier here. Okay, So it's a different type of fear. I think we're talking about the fear of eternal damnation. <laughs> we're all going to die one day. Uh, versus the fear that goes, God is God. I know my place before him, so I respond rightly to him. Two different types of fear. Yeah, does that answer your question? Uh, I don't think there are, and it's the same. So Roz has asked for people, are there two different words for fear? I think it's, um, and Ruben will correct me here if I'm wrong, I think it's the tomato word group, um, but uh, the context helps us think that. It's like the word uh, for Greek for tempt and test, uh, which is the peradzo word group. And depending on the context, uh, you'll translate it as test or tempt. And so well, the context helps you understand what type of fear you're dealing with. So that's why I want to say context is judgment day, not relationship with your father. Yeah. 